So here's a story I think you're going to find pretty interesting from a lot of perspectives. It's how I became or decided to become a video journalist. It's a story of guns, uh, Gaza, Palestinians, network news, and most importantly, money. So let me start from the beginning, at least from the beginning of this particular story. After much hard work and uh, good family connections, I had become a television producer at CBS News, working for Sunday Morning, the Charles Corral show that's still on the air. They do soft news pieces, and that was fine with me, and you get a lot of time to do them. Of course, I found working with correspondents and famous reporters incredibly annoying, because as the producer, I or you end up doing all the work, and they get all the credit. But that's the system, and if you're going to work there, you have to buy into it, and that's fine. But it was annoying. Before I had gone into the television business and with my Middle East stuff, I actually had spent a lot of time doing photography around the world. When I graduated from Williams College, I got a Watson Foundation Fellowship that allowed me to spend three years traveling around the world with a little camera taking pictures. And I thought this was a pretty cool way to work. You'd come to some village, you'd live there, you'd take some photographs, and you go home. Of course, nobody was paying me for them, but it was an interesting kind of an insight. Anyway. So by the time I'm 30 years old, I'm working at CBS News as a full-fledged network producer for one of their flagship shows. I'm probably making $100,000 a year, which was a lot of money in the 1980s, and especially at my age. And it looked like my career was on a great path to success. But I found some stuff annoying. One day, I got assigned to do a story about guns. Now, this is not, you know, an unusual thing. There had been some... Um, some uh, altercation at some school or something where some nut had gone in with a, a you know a military grade weapon and a machine gun or a, an assault rifle and started shooting things up and of course that's probably what precipitated the piece but I was assigned to do a story about a place called Gun Valley or Gun Alley which is in Connecticut ironically and that's where most quality handguns are made. These are not Saturday Night Specials. These are Colt and Smith Wesson and places like that. And so they do, they make the finest handguns in the world. And I called them up and I said, I'm from CBS News Sunday morning and I want to come and I want to do a story about Gun Alley and about Smith Wesson. And they said, no, 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 we don't want television news. We don't want CBS here. We know what you're going to do. You're going to do something about, you know, firearms in school and assault rifles. And we don't make assault rifles. We take a lot of pride in the craftsmanship of our work. And I said, listen to me, this is not 60 minutes, this is Sunday morning, you know, I just want to do a nice profile piece about the, and I had read about them, and they take a lot of pride in what they do, and okay, they make handguns, but handguns are legal, but it's a craftsmanship story. And so I went back and forth with them, and I said, I swear to God, I am not going to do anything about assault rifles here. They said, we don't make assault rifles, we got nothing to do with assault rifles. I said, that's great, I'm not going to discuss assault rifles, I just want to come up there. And so with a great deal of trepidation, they let me in. And, of course, I went there to do the piece, and uh, I started to shoot the thing. And, you know, they were great, and they were very friendly. I'm just going to answer the phone here for a second. No, I'm not, because it's not there. Just let it ring. So they went off to, to do the story, and uh, I went off to do the story, and they were great. And they were very open-ended, and it was true. It was really about craftsmanship, and they were very good about it and very pleasant about it. And I shot the piece the way that I wanted to shoot it, and they were happy, and I was happy. And so I came home, and I cut the piece with the editor, and I presented it to, to Linda Mason, who was the executive producer, and she looked at it. We had this screening session with her, and she said, this is terrible. And I said, what do you mean it's terrible? She said, there's nothing in here about assault rifles. And I said, there's nothing in there about assault rifles because Smith Wesson, they don't make assault rifles. They make these, they spend a lot of time. It's craftsmanship. People collect them. She said, you put in assault rifles in here. And I said, I can't put in assault rifles. I told them that there would be no assault rifles. She said, you don't, pr this is CBS News, you don't promise anything to anybody. So they went back to the edit, and of course it was my job that was on the line, so we got all this stock footage of people in guns, schools, shooting people up with assault rifles and all that kind of stuff, and I, I put it in the piece because I worked for CBS, and, and so the piece aired, and of course the guy from Smith Wesson called me up, and he reamed me a new one. He said, you lied to me, I knew this was going to happen, I knew I couldn't trust you, and you know what, he was right. So uh, I quit. I mean, that's not the only reason I quit, but I quit. And I thought, I'm not doing this anymore. And instead, I bought myself a little, little, it was about this big, home video camera. 
And I thought, I had always wondered, could you do television journalism the way radio journalism is done, where a guy just goes out with a tape recorder, or photojournalism is done, which is what I did when the guy just goes camera, or print journalism, where one guy just goes with a pad of paper. Why did you need the stupid cameraman, the producer, the editor, the, the director, all this crap that you bring along with you? It complicated things. And more importantly, why the hell did you need CBS News to go and do journalism? So I quit. And people, of course, thought I was out of my mind. My old man said, are you crazy? crazy, and even Fred Friendly, my mentor in the business, who had been the president of CBS News, said, that is the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. You're going to do this by yourself? And probably I was just stupid. I was just stupid. And, you know, everybody thought $30,000, $100,000 a year, you quit the job, you'll never work in this industry, blah, blah, blah. So I quit. And I bought myself a little camera, and I needed a story that people were interested in. I had nobody, connect connections, no nothing. But I took my little camera, and I went back to Gaza. If you remember from yesterday's story, I had actually lived in the Gaza Strip when I was a kid, and I knew people there. So I took my little video camera, and it was the beginning of the Intifada, actually. It was just a lucky time to be there. So I went back, and I went back to Marna House, and I found Mrs. Shawa, and she remembered me. And so she set me up with another family in Jabalia Refugee Camp, which was the most dangerous and most terrible, you know, all this news stuff that was going on. And so I lived with a family in Jabalia Refugee Camp for a month with my little video camera, and I just shot all the stuff that happened to me. Now, it was really interesting because it was the Intifada. Uh, every morning, the American network crews would drive down from Tel Aviv. They were staying in the hotels in Tel Aviv. And they would come with the Israeli film crews, and they would also bring security guards. And they would come to the edge of Gaza, and they would set up their cameras, and the guys would stand there, here on the edge of the Gaza Strip, blah, 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 all in a row. And, of course, the kids in Gaza knew they were coming. So they would come, and they would throw stones and all this kind of stuff and give them a great show. And then, of course, when their live feed was over, the kids would go home, and everybody went home. And so they made television. But they didn't do much in the way of journalism, because none of those big reporters from the networks bothered to go actually into the camp. Too dangerous. You'll get killed. Don't go there. So here I was living in the refugee camp with his family, and the Palestinians, I mean, in the beginning, they drove them, what are you doing here? But eventually they got to trust me, so much so that, you know, they took me in to meet with the head of the PLO and whoever was there, and, and once we were out there and the Israelis came in, they started shooting at them, some guy got hit in the head, and an ambulance came, and they go, wait, wait, get Mike, let him come, come in the ambulance with us. So we went to Shifa Hospital, and I got great, I mean, I got great stuff, because like any good journalism, it's all about access, and access means you've got to spend time. Well, you can't spend time if you're going off with a big crew and a famous correspondent and a cameraman and all this kind of crap. So I was there for a month, just filming every day whatever stuff happened to me. And then I came back to New York, to my little apartment in Brooklyn. Of course, my old man, you stupid idiot, you quit your job, you got no money, what are you going to do now? I didn't really know what I was going to do, but I had this great pile of tapes and all this good stuff that I had gotten. So um, I took it over to PBS, because I used to work at Channel 13. And I went to see Les Crystal, who was the executive producer of the McNeil Lira News Hour. And I said, look what I got. And I said, look what I got. So I showed him my pile of tapes, and he screened it. And he turned to me, and he said, I want to buy two of these stories. I'd shot a bunch of stories. And they paid me $50,000 for the two stories, $25,000 each. Well, from, their, from my perspective, that was sort of unbelievable, because I made $50,000 in one month. From their perspective, you know, this was cheap, because they didn't have to send the cameraman, the producer, you know, Robin McNeil, the expensive airfares, hotels, meals, all that kind of stuff. So I, they aired it. I was happy. They were happy. We were all happy. And they said, what else can you do? And so I spent the next two years kind of traveling around the world with my little video camera. I went to you know, Cambodia and with the Khmer Rouge, and I went to Afghanistan, and I, went, I found the index case for AIDS in Uganda, which I did for Ted Koppel on Nightline. And so I sort of, by accident in a way, uh, and by demonstration, because you have to go do stuff if you want to do stuff, I demonstrated that you could make television in a very different way. You didn't need the cameraman, the sound man, the producer, the editor, the director, or CBS News, an executive producer telling you what to do. You, don't, you didn't need any of that stuff. And we're talking about 30 years ago. Now, the technology, of course, now you could do it with an iPhone. And so the, uh, the fact that, that NBC, which is just across the street, or CBS, they still work in this incredibly stupid, expensive, complicated, CNN, it's crazy, it's crazy, and it's totally unnecessary. There is no reason that television journalism can't be done exactly the same way that print journalism is done. How is print journalism done? Here's the camera, there's, here's the pencil, there's the door. 
Go out and get a story. How is radio journalism done? Here's the tape recorder. There's the door. Go out and get a story. How is photo journalism done? Here's your camera. There's the door. Go out and shoot a story. There is no reason that television journalism can't be done in exactly the same way. And that was the idea 30 years ago, and I proved it worked then. And, of course, we've been pushing this concept ever since. It never occurred to me. I'd still be doing this business and still selling this idea 30 years from now. But it can be done. And so if you want to do journalism, here's my advice. Quit the network, walk out the door, get yourself a video camera, and go and do it like a writer. Either it works or it doesn't work. But trust me. If you've got half a brain, it's not that hard, and the technology is fantastic, it'll work. So there's my story of how I became a video journalist. Guns, uh, Gaza, uh, uh, CBS News, and money. And if they didn't pay, of course, I wouldn't do it. So there you go. More stories coming. I hope you enjoyed this one. Bye.